Good morning. If you have your Bibles with you today, why don't you take those out? Let's do God the honor and the glory. and Turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, I'm sure there's probably one in the pew. Uh, if you can't find one there, there's a blue newsletter that got handed out. And I noticed that the passage we're going to read from today is in there. So somewhere there's a Bible of God, something for you that has God's Word on it for you to be able to follow along. So be ready to do that. We'll get our Bible our Bible workout this morning. Um, real quick, I, I got about tw 25 minutes, is that right? About 25 minutes. I don't, I don't want to cut into a Bible teacher's time. Being a Bible teacher, I know how, how precious that time is. So I'll make sure that I get it all in within that, that, that time frame. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4 this morning, we're going to talk about uh, what's called the Christian walk. And the whole, the whole chapter, chapter 4, is about the Christian walk. The first part of chapter 4 is what I call the inward walk, and that really goes right on to verse 16. But what we're going to talk about, uh, not, not the unity of the inward walk, but the outward walk, okay? Which means uh, the walk that we do when we're outside of the church walls, right? When we're outside of this fellowship out in the world, and what kind of walk that is. Uh, anybody in here walk for exercise? Anybody? We got a few? All right, cool. Me too. Me too. How many runners we got? We got runners in here? All right, see, they, yeah, they weren't raising their hands for walkers. They knew better than that, right? We got runners. Very good. Now, now if you're exercising, <clears throat> that, that's a great thing. Uh, as Paul tells Timothy about that bodily exercise, it does have a little profit. Uh, walking, kind of, uh, if, you're, if you're used to doing that or running, having a regiment like that can get you used to uh, being on what's called a schedule. And my wife, uh, not so many years ago, uh, decided she was going to uh, run slash walk, right, a mini marathon, which was 13.2 miles. And about eight weeks before the race started, I asked her a question. I said, you know, I know the race is coming up. It's coming soon. Uh, you think you might want to do some training? Uh, she said, well, I'm doing a little bit on the treadmill at work, on lunch. And I said... Baby, I don't think you know how far 13.2 miles is. Uh, me from being in the Army, I know exactly how far that is. And it takes some training to get there. And unfortunately, she, she would argue with me today that she put some of that training in. I would dare say that I don't really think she did. But when she started that race, I said, you take your phone with you. Because if something happens well, on that race and you don't make it, you call me and I'll, wherever you are, I'll come down there and I'll get you. Well, you got like four and a half hours, I think, finished the race. <clears throat> so three and a half hours in, I hadn't heard anything, and she had not yet come to the finish line. I got a little concerned. I called her on the phone a few times. She didn't answer. I thought, oh, no, something's happened. She didn't train. She, she has an injury. She, she's not going to make it. Finally, she answered her phone. I said, where are you? I'm concerned about you. She's huffing and puffing and getting every breath she possibly can out. She says, I'm about to turn the last corner. I said, I was just about to come looking for you. And she said, I sure wish I had trained for this thing. <laughs> she starts coming down the road, and I only had one little boy at that time. That's my, my oldest son there. And I'll tell you what, she crossed the finish line and pretty much collapsed right after that. But it was all about the finish line. That's what it's all about. The whole race isn't about just running the race. It's about what was at the end. And what waited for her that day was victory. And upon that crossing of the finish line and her family, who loved her very much and was cheering her on out of concern. The Christian walk is the same way, guys. It's a race that, unfortunately, many people start and they never finish. But our goal is to finish, and it is that, it's that very thing. And Paul deals with this with the church of Ephesus because there are Christians there who had started the race, and you know what happens is sometimes when, when you did, for, for those of us who weren't blessed enough to grow up in the church, we tend to become Christians, and then we go back to what we know, what we know the best. And what we know the best is the world. And the world gets a grip on you, and it doesn't want to let go of you. And that's what he's talking about, verse 17 where we'll be this morning, verse 17, he says, So I say and affirm together with the Lord <clears throat> that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the hardness of their heart. 
And they, having become callous, having given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ this way. Now, here, an easier way of saying that is, why would you want to go back to the world? Once you have seen what it is that Christ has to offer, why would you want to be like the world? Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, some of my, my favorite verses there, uh, to become a, a living sacrifice, which is acceptable, uh, perfect and acceptable will of God, right? Finding out what that is and proving that. But in verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may find out what that will is. Transformed. Not conform to what the world does, which is a Christian struggle. And it's a, Christ, it's a struggle that these Christians had. Just because you become a Christian, don't be in the illusion to think that all the struggles are now over. They're not. Don't be in the illusion of thinking that because you become a Christian and you're in the fellowship of Christ that now the devil will leave you alone and you will enjoy that fellowship and the temptations that you used to have, you will no longer have. That is a lie. Never did God promise to take the temptations away from you. What he did do, however, here is teach us how to now deal with those temptations. And we are not dealing with them alone. We now have Christ. We not only have Christ, but also the body of Christ. This is each and every one of you. He says, why do you want to be like the rest of the world? You know, our kids grow up wanting to be like people <laughs> they they pick out a person like for instance my boys uh, might want to be like like their dad my, my, caution them about that. maybe they'll be more like mom maybe but 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 a lot of us want to be like our parents or a grandparent or a good friend but some of us even maybe grow up and we idolize professional athletes you know that's pretty common at school uh, i'm a school teacher as well as a, a preacher i teach at a christian school and I asked all my class the very first week of school, I said, do me a favor. I want, you to, I want you to write down what you want to be when you grow up. This is what I asked my middle school class. And I got some pretty interesting uh, papers handed back in. Uh, some of them wanted to be firefighters. I was like, man, that's awesome. Good, great. Be a firefighter. We need those. Some of them wanted to be soldiers. Uh, some of them wanted to be accountants. Some of them wanted to just be like their mom and dad. Uh, one kid even said he wanted to be like Thor. Well, I can't help you out there, brother. I said, I'm, I, I don't think you're going to make it as, as far as Thor. But, but, but then one kid handed in a piece of paper who has now uh, become a, a regular uh, a follower uh, going with me to the church, now coming up there. He handed in a piece of paper and he says, I want to be like you. And I was like, wow, okay, no pressure, right? And so after class, I called him up and I said, I said, I want to talk to you about that. I said, why do you want to be like me? He said, well, because I want to be a preacher when I grow up. I said, well, okay. Yeah, I respect that. I said, but can I, can I encourage you with something that most people won't tell you? He said, sure. I said, look, you, you don't want to be like me. If you want to be like somebody, you want to be like Jesus. You get in that Bible and you follow that master teacher. You don't follow me. I make mistakes. I'm imperfect. You follow me long enough, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make the same ones that I make. You don't want to be like me. You want to be like the Lord. You just keep looking at him and you keep trying to be like him and you keep trying to over the, overcome the world with him at your side and you'll make it. You'll finish the walk. You see, when we put our faith in people... We get let down every time. You put your faith in God, you never get let down. God will never leave you nor forsake you. And Paul here, encouraging the church, you don't want to be like the world. As a matter of fact, he says, you did not learn Christ that way. You want to be like Christ. Not like everybody else. Not like an NBA basketball player. Not like the school teacher. You want to be like Jesus. <coughs> That's who we learn and who we follow. And you know what happens is he says that you haven't become callous. Having become callous. You know why he says that? Uh, I'm sure you all know uh, many of you uh, uh, guys may work with your hands. And on your hands you develop calluses on your hands. Uh, I'm from Kentucky. 
and yes, it's true, no, we don't wear shoes there. It's, it's a true statement, okay? When I was growing up, I, I didn't even own a pair of shoes half the time. Summertime, shoes were, were a myth, right? But when I was a little boy, my, my, I could, uh, my feet became so callous never wearing shoes that I could run across a gravel driveway barefooted, right? Uh, I could step on bees and get stung. I'd never even feel the stinger. And then I got a little older and I started wearing shoes all the time. And now if I walk out of the house, my feet are so sensitive, I step on a little pebble, you know, I, I'm crying like a little girl. My wife's making fun of me. But there was a time when I was callous to all the things that I would step on. And that's what he's trying to say about sin. He says, listen, if you try to go back to that life, you try to go back to that sin, and you do it long enough, you're going to become callous to what is right. If you sin long enough, you don't know what's right anymore. You don't know what's good because you, your senses have been dulled and you become callous to the things that are wrong. Friends, this is a problem many Christians struggle with. Somebody here today is struggling with that. Maybe many somebodies. You're not alone. Stay away from the things that will make you callous to what is righteous. Because you did not learn Christ in that way, verse 20. If indeed you have heard him and been taught by him, just as the truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, uh, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is created in the likeness of God, being created in righteousness and holiness and truth. Now, he's saying, you, another way of saying you did not learn Christ that way is saying you know better. You ought to know better than that. Uh, now, when I, I had two brothers growing up, and I am the oldest brother. That's right, I'm the oldest. And when, whenever all of us would get into something, we'd all get in trouble. And my dad would hear things going on that shouldn't be going on. Uh, he had a practice that he used often, and I hated then, and I still do. He would walk straight into the room, and no matter what was going on, he'd take his hand, he'd slap me across the back of the head, and then he'd start asking questions. And every time I would say, Dad, why do you always come in and hit me? He said, because you're the oldest, and you ought to know better. You should have been the one to take control of the things that were going on, and you knew better than to do that. You see, when you become a Christian and you learn Christ and you have been created in the likeness of God and righteousness, holiness, and truth, Paul's saying, you are no better than that. You know better than to be out sinning. You know better than to be going back to the old life, to be in places that you shouldn't be and doing things that you shouldn't be doing. You know better. How do I know that? Well, because you learned Christ. That means you know better than to be doing that. Put off the old self, put on the new. The old man, of course, in Romans 6, he dies. We bury him. New man's resurrected. But you know what we want to do? The hardest thing is to hold on to the old man. We want to be grave robbers. We want to go back and dig him up occasionally and see how he's doing. Uh, anybody in here like fishing? I love fishing. Only a couple. Well, y'all might not like this story then. <laughs> I'm in trouble. I should have picked another story. Uh, when I was in the Army, I served in the United States Army uh, for almost four years. And uh, well, one of the, the things I loved to do was when I'd come home on leave with uh, my family, I'd always ask my dad, he had a real nice skeeter bass boat, and I'd say, Dad, I want to go fishing. He'd say, great, we'll take the boat out. And it was our tradition to go out there fishing. We'd stay the night uh, in the boat. We'd sleep in the boat. Uh, we'd night fish. We'd fish in the morning. We'd basically fish until we were about ready to drop. And I still love doing that today just as much as I did then. Uh, one specific trip, we went out, uh, went to a place called Nolan Lake. Y'all might have heard of that. It's a, it's a pretty big deal. Went to Nolan Lake and had a great night of fishing. At about 5.30 in the morning, we're all sleeping in the boat and it started to rain. And then started to lightning, right? And so if you've ever been on the water and lightning has hit nearby you, then you know what I'm talking about. You know how scary that really is. And that's what, and of course, my dad could sleep probably through a hurricane. He can definitely sleep through a lightning storm. 
Okay, he heard none of that. My brother and I, however, jumped up in the boat. We're in a panic. Dad, get up. We got to get out of here. Well, he backs the boat up. Now, mind you, this boat on a normal day would run about 65, 70 miles an hour on top of water. It's pretty cool. We take off. He's like, yeah, we got to get to the dock, boys. We got to get out of here. We're going to get nailed. And he goes flying across the water, and all of a sudden, the boat slows down. And it just won't go. And he kept looking over and asked me, he said, does it seem like the boat just won't go? And I was like, yeah, it's running real sluggish. Wondering what's up with that? So finally, we get into the no-wake zone. We slow down. We're coming through. And all of a sudden, the boat just whips to the right. We hit another boat that's, that's docked there. And nearly threw my brother all the way out of the boat and almost broke his arm. And we're all looking at each other like, what happened? Dad says, I don't know. Let me back the boat up. So he backs up the boat. He tries again. Sure enough, the boat spins to the right. We hit another guy's boat again. I said, Dad, what is going on? He's like, son, I don't know. The boat just won't go. It's like we're hung up. I said, Dad, did you pull up the anchor? He said, I sure didn't. He started to edge forward, and you know, Wes, that's the scary part. He starts ed- edging forward, and we were hung up on power lines, and we were pulling them up from the bottom. And I seen, I said, Dad, we're hung up on the power lines. He says, man, get your knife out and cut that anchor loose. Man, I cut that thing loose, and we got out of there. And when we got up on the shore, you could see a huge mud trail running all the way through the lake, right? Now, we almost died that day dragging the anchor. You know, that's just what it's like putting off an old self, what Paul says, and putting on the new. You try to hang on to that old self, that's like hanging on to a boat anchor. And you try dragging that along with you, you're going to drag up a muddy trail of sin behind you. Because sin don't just affect you, it affects everybody in the boat. And if you're not careful, that sin will kill you. Because eventually you're going to get hung on something because that's what sin does. And that's what it does the best. Is sin knows where it can grab you. It knows where to hold on. It knows where to hang you up. And when it does, it doesn't want to let go. And if you stay there too long, it will kill you eternally. I'm not worried so much about on this side. What happens on the other side? And unfortunately, it just drags a nasty, muddy trail up behind you. He says, you got to put off the old man. He dies. Don't drag him along with you. You have got to cut sin loose. Turn to Christ in the likeness and holiness and truth of God. We've only got a few minutes. Let's look at verse 25. He gets into talking about some very specific things that the person who has a changed life does. He starts in verse 25 saying, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth with, uh, with your neighbor, I'm sorry, speak truth each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. You see, that's a telltale sign. When you put on Christ and put off the old person, you stop lying all the time, right? We don't, we don't tell lies anymore. We put away lying, but we've exchanged that for something better. That's the truth. And we all know that person, don't we? We all know that person, that, that man or woman, that if they're talking, they're lying, right? We know who they are. We just hope that ain't the Christian, right? We don't, we don't want that. We want it to be that person. And if it is, you need to put it away. But replace that with the truth. No matter, what, no matter how bad it hurts, replace it with the truth. He says in uh, verse 26, Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Your Bible might say wrath. You're going to learn how to control your anger. Now, I had a serious problem with that growing up. Maybe I'll share that with you some other time. But you have got to learn to control yourself. And nobody sees the Christian angry and out of control. Nobody goes, oh, look at that Christian over there screaming his head off. No one does that. And, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, I've seen Christians be angry and be hateful and nasty to each other. And it's ugly and it's disgusting and it is not of God. He says, no, you've put that away. Now you control yourself. Watch what you do and what you say. Next he says in verse 27, and do not give the devil an opportunity. There's no better opportunity. Uh, let the devil into your life and have him give him full control than when you're angry because that's when you do and say things that you shouldn't. Verse 28, he who steals must steal no longer, but work uh, but with his own hand, work with his own hands what is good, uh, performing 
Uh, I'll get it out here in a minute. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with those who have need. Now, here he says, if you take things that don't belong to you, most of us have done that at one time or another, you don't do that anymore. But it's not just about not stealing. It's not just about, well, now I go to work. No, let's look again. He says, you labor with your own hands so that you will have something to share with one who has need. That's the Christian attitude. No, I've put away taking anything that don't belong to me, but rather than that, I'm going to work really, really hard. I'm going to work hard with my own hands, but not just for me. I'm going to work hard so I have something to share if somebody else has a need. Whoever that is, might be in your family, it might not. That's what a Christian does. He goes on and says here, uh, verse 29, uh, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word that is good for edification, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Uh, you'll always be looking for a way to build somebody up, right, with your words. And Christians ought to be doing that, encouraging, edifying, building people up. We ought to be bodybuilders, Right? That's what we're trying to do. If something's coming out of your mouth, it should give grace to people that hear and build them up in a way that makes them a better them. It's not all about us. It's about what we can do to serve others. So if I'm saying things, there are going to be things that help you. They're going to give grace to you. Uh, as he says to the Colossian church, speak your words of grace as though seasoned with salt so you'll know how to respond to the need of the moment. Right? I'm going to build people up with what I say. I was having a Bible study with a Christian man one time, and <laughs> you know the guy just had a hard time saying anything good about anybody. And I said, you know what? I said, there's a, there's a way you can fix this. Because I've noticed that you don't talk good about any person. You don't have anything good to say. I said, I got the solution. He says, what is it? I said, don't talk. <laughs> I said, you've got a lot better chance going to heaven if you learn to keep your mouth shut. You see, some Christians say too much, right? And they don't have, my mom told me when I was growing up, boy, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all, right? Y'all have heard that before. Well, that's biblical. If you can't build people up, then be quiet until you can. He says, verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This is really the idea of not sinning willfully, right? <laughs> We're not going to continue on in sin on purpose over and over and over because we can go back to the first part of the chapter where we become callous to that sin and then what happens? Well, it gets a foothold on us and we've lost it, right? We're lost. Verse 31, let bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Those are all the things that he just mentioned. Verse 32, be kind to one another and tenderhearted Forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Now, we're about ready to close here in just a second. <clears throat> forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Uh, forgiveness, maybe I should say this, was there anybody in here that don't need any forgiveness today? I don't see any hands up. Okay. He's grounded, you know, just so you know. Now, forgiveness at my house comes pretty often, right? And at home, I, you know, we, we get that begrudging forgiveness. You know what I'm talking about. Many of y'all ever had little kids. Some of y'all got grandkids. What happens? They get in a fight. They start fighting with each other. And what comes next? Hey, you two, stop that. And then you grab a hold of them. Maybe you discipline them. Whatever it is that's needed. And then what happens right after that? So now you go over here and you tell him you're sorry. And he goes, I'm sorry. You say, now you tell him that you forgive him. And he goes, I forgive you. Is that forgiveness? <laughs> no. And you know, adults are the same way, guys. Christians are the same way. Sometimes we struggle with that. We say, you know, I want to forgive the person that keeps coming up front and sitting down in the front pew every other week. And I want to keep forgiving them. But man, do they really have to keep doing the same thing all the time? You know, I'll tell you when that forgiveness is the most necessary in our lives is when we need it. We know exactly what it means then. 
when I've made that mistake and I've got to be the one to come up and say, listen, I need prayers. I need your love. I need your help. I know that God can do that, and I know he will use you to do it. And when we need that, we know exactly what it is. We don't need to ask any questions about it. And not only that, we expect that people are going to do it. Forgiveness costs a great and terrible price. Matthew 26 in verse 28, Jesus said, This is the blood, my blood, of the new covenant, which will be poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Not a person in here doesn't have sin. Not a person in here doesn't need forgiveness. Maybe what we need to work on, and you might not, but if you may need to work on making sure you give that forgiveness just as much as you need it. Why don't you pray with me this morning? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your Son. We know that as we come together here on this day, this glorious first day of the week, and we prepare, Father, to give you more of our worship, we pray that all that we do will be pleasing in your sight. Father, we thank you that we've been able to open your perfect word. We pray, Father, that the things that have been said will fall on good and open hearts. If there's anybody here today, Father, struggles with the things that have been mentioned, that your word will help guide them through that dark time in their life and right into your marvelous light. Father, we thank you so much for your son. Well, we would not be here without him. We know, Father, that the terrible price he paid was his body and his blood on the cross so long ago that each and every one of us may have the forgiveness that we just talked about. Father, we pray that as we walk as Christians each day, as we go through the Christian walk, that we are tempted by evil and we are tempted by the things of this life that tend to try to grab us as we walk, that we would cut them loose. We pray, Father, you would help each and every one of us as Christians encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we see them fall, that we will help them get up. We will dust them off, Father, and we will help guide them down the path that they should go. Father, we pray you forgive each and every one of us as we continue here in a moment to go through a, another hour of study of your perfect word. We ask it all through the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I believe now we'll have our scripture reading.
I'll be happy enough to pick me up, I'm sure. John 20 is where our lesson will be today. John chapter 20, the Gospel John. And we don't have time to read all of the scripture today, so I'm going to kind of summarize what some of the chapter is about. We have here the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, that comes uh, a lady named Mary comes early to the tomb where Jesus uh, had been buried. The stone had already been rolled away, and she sees it that no one is there. She runs to tell her friends, Peter, amongst those people. They all run down there, and, and, and of course, uh, they, they, find, they find nothing. They go back to their homes. And verse 11 is where I want to begin uh, this morning with the introduction. It says, But Mary was standing outside the tomb, weeping. And so, as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb, and she saw the two, that two angels were in white sitting, one at the head and one at, and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been laying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in the Hebrew, Rabbani, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he has said these things to her. Now, this is where we are going to begin our lesson this morning. There's your introduction, right? What's going on here? Well, Jesus, as we say many times, is not dead. We do not serve, a, a, there, there is an empty tomb in Jerusalem, and it's because there's a resurrected Jesus who came out of that tomb and walked amongst people, and he is alive. And as we'll see later on, he is seated now at the right hand of God. Mary finds that tomb. She finds that tomb, tells her friends, they all go. And then, you know what's strange about that? Jesus appears there, but she doesn't know who he is. And she supposed him to be the gardener. And then he says her name. He says, Mary. And she turns and then looks at him and he tells her, Stop clinging to me. I'm not yet ascended to the Father. You go to my brethren and tell them that I am going to ascend. You know, one of the things about Jesus' resurrection uh, is that his crucifixion and resurrection together were kind of a big letdown for a lot of disciples. And what I mean by that is disciples didn't really understand who Jesus was. They, they just really didn't get it. And they weren't supposed to at that time. They weren't supposed to fully understand who Jesus was. But many times uh, through the book of Luke, two times in the ninth chapter, one time in the 18th chapter, he predicts his death. And they tell him things like, far be it from you, right, that any of these things take place. It even goes as far as Jesus to tell his one of his closest disciples, Peter, get behind me, Satan. And he says that because Peter's literally trying to get in the way of Jesus fulfilling Scripture. And what people often had a hard time with in the first century, and they still do today, is they have the wrong perception of who Jesus really is. <coughs> Acts 17 uh, is one of my favorite chapters in all of the Bible, and it's because we find there that Christians had turned the world upside down. But what we also find there is why they did. Christians turned the world upside down, my friends, because they had accepted Jesus as their king. Jesus is the king. And that, that was the decree being made, that Jesus is the king. And those who come here claiming that and the opposite of the decrees of Caesar, they turned the world upside down. Some people didn't see Jesus as the king, though. They had the wrong perception of who he truly was. Now, sometimes we have the wrong perception of, of things as well. I was preaching a sermon one time uh, at, at, the, at the church where I, I very first started. Uh, God bless those people forever even letting me do that. But, but I, I preached a sermon one time, and I had recently been on a hunting trip. And I met some really nice Amish people there that were very kind and friendly to me and my friend. And for breakfast one morning, 
uh, I was I was talking about how this man come with his little boy, and he brought us uh, some some cake over with, with our breakfast. What well, nice guy! I guess Domish. I guess maybe eat cake for breakfast. I'm not sure about that, but they, he was really nice to bring that over. And my friend and I, we had recently uh, got a deer that morning, and we had cut the tenderloins out there of the deer. We were eating that, and he showed up, and we had a, a can of uh, camel soup uh, between the two of us. And so I told the congregation, I said it was actually nice to have the cake. Because at that time, we had a weird combination of soup and deer. And I got some really weird looks from the congregation. And I thought, man, maybe people don't like honey and they don't like deer. I don't know. And one of the elders came from the back of the room. He came up front and sat in the front. And I thought, well, I've done it now. <laughs> I don't know what I've said, but I've clearly made a mistake. Right after the sermon, I walked to the back and... And uh, that elder got up and he followed me to the back and he said, hey, listen, I have to ask you this question. Did you say to the congregation that you were on a hunting trip and you had soup and beer? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, sir, I did not say. I said, dear. And he said, well, I clearly had the wrong perception of what you said. I said, well, that explains why everybody quit listening halfway through. <laughs> you know, see, sometimes we don't, we don't hear things like we're supposed to. We don't see things like we're supposed to. And the scriptures had been telling the Jewish nation, my friends, for, for many, many years that this Jesus would come, he would be God in the flesh, he would have to suffer and die at the hands of the chief magistrates, the scribes, the Pharisees, but that he would be resurrected. And people just didn't get it. Even Mary here, he calls out her name. And he says, Mary, as if she ought to know who he was. And you know, the world today a lot of times don't know who Jesus is either. Now, I hear Christians say things all the time about, about the Lord. Well, I, I may even be saying some things that the Lord had done, and Christians will say, oh, well, my Lord never did that. He wouldn't do that. Well, yes, he did. You weren't listening to what he said. A lot of times, God is perceived today by the world, not so much us, but by the world, as some spiritual grandpa. God just... God loves everybody. God is love. Well, that's absolutely true. God is also wrath. God is also mercy. All those things fit in there. But God is oftentimes glorified as the spiritual grandpa above. Nobody's going to be punished. He loves everyone. Hey, we're all going to the same place, right? We're just taking different ways to get there. But we all end up in the same place at the end because God is just this wonderful, wonderful grandfather. Unfortunately, the Bible does not support that. Jesus says in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way. I am the, the light. I am the truth. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, it's not a way, but the way. And you see, people have a hard time perceiving, even here, that Jesus is, was, and is the way. How do you perceive him Today, how do you take him? See, your king, because if he's your king, you see, when Jesus becomes your king, every part of your life will change. Your whole life turn upside down, and you'll be, you'll be the, the 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 walls of the church will have to expand because there'll be nobody that can get in your way of building others up with Jesus Christ. When he's your king, that's what happened in the first century. We have here Mary going to her disciples, just as Jesus tells her to do. After she doesn't know, she thinks he's the gardener. But she goes in verse 19, it says, So when it was evening of the day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut, and the disciples, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst, and he said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. And the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. And as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And then he breathed, and, and uh, I'm sorry, on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And if you forgive the sins of any, they will be, have been forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Now, this is very important. I want you to understand that Christianity in the first century did begin by seeing the belief. 100% began that way. It did begin by seeing to believe. That, what that means is these apostles, 
who Jesus chose, had to be our witnesses, as Peter describes in 1 Peter chapter 2, our witnesses of his life, his death, and his resurrection. That was a must. As he says in his own words in 1 Peter, uh, 2 Peter rather, chapter 2, that we did not uh, follow cunningly devised fables, but saw Jesus Christ, his glory, and his majesty. We were eyewitnesses of these things. What it meant to be an apostle, we had to see all three. And that's important because that those are the men who established the first century church. They go through and they build many churches. What I mean is in different areas. It's all one church. You had to be able to see the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in order to fall into this category. That means they also were not tricked. These were not stories told, just, just handed down stories. No, these were men who actually lived right next to Jesus and saw everything that he did. And he is giving them power here, a portion of that power. He breathes on them. They receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, he gives them the forgiveness of, uh, says to forgive the sins. They have been forgiven. And if you retain, they have been retained. These men are special and they are pioneers of the church. We would call them leaders of the church, Jesus says, apostles. But unfortunately, there's one guy who's not there that day. His name is Thomas. Thomas was his disciple. He wasn't there. Verse 24, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails... And I put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side. I will not believe. Now, some people might say, well, Thomas was a doubter. No, he wasn't. Thomas was promised evidence from Jesus himself on at least three different occasions that he would show himself alive to him personally. Three times. Thomas wants the evidence. He said, listen, that is great. You all were there, and you all were telling me about what happened, and you saw Jesus. You, you saw the imprints on his body, but I didn't see him. He promised those same things to me. Thomas wanted the evidence that Jesus promised him. You know, it, it's always kind of stood out to me that Thomas wasn't there when Jesus came. I, I don't know why Thomas wasn't there. I mean, he may have had a very, very good reason why he wasn't there. I'm not sure. The Bible doesn't tell us that. But this is what I do know about not being with disciples when they gather. Anytime disciples, Christians are getting together and we're not there, we miss something. Every time. Whether it be a worship service, if you're not at worship service, you miss something. If you're not in the get together afterwards where Christians are going to be together and have all things in common, Acts 2 verse 42, if you're not there, then you miss something. Something important will happen, and you'll miss that. You think here, Thomas missed the Lord coming. And I've got some, some young kids now that, are, uh, that, I, that I pick up for uh, church services on Sunday morning and Sunday night. And we've got about nine or ten guys that come pretty regularly. And so I'm going to have to get a bigger vehicle first, I guess. And then, nextly, sometimes they don't all get out of the bed. They give me some of those lame excuses, right? I said, well, I was just tired. I didn't want to, I didn't want to get up and then come this morning. I just couldn't make it. I was up too late last night. One of the boys, he's, he's kind of uh, became like a, a son to me. So I'm very frank with him when I speak with him. He told me a couple of weeks ago, he says, well, I just, I just had too much going on. I said, well, I'm going to tell you, brother, it's a good thing the Lord didn't come back today because we had all been there and he'd been with us and you wouldn't have made it because you had too much going on. Too many other things that were more important than being there with fellow Christians. What if you would have missed his return? Now, we're not going to miss the return. We're all going to meet Jesus in the air. There'll be a judgment. We understand that. Christians are together worshiping Jesus. You're not here. You're missing something something important. Most importantly, you're missing an opportunity to worship God. Once here in a moment, we're going to see that's exactly what Thomas does when Jesus comes. He worships him. And you're missing that. 
You're missing not some burden, not some place you have to be. You are missing an opportunity, a gift from God to come and worship Him and give Him what He deserves for all that He has done for us. Thomas missed out. I don't know why, but I know he missed a great thing. And then he has to wait eight days, verse 26. After eight days, the disciples were again together, and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came, and the doors having been shut, he stood in the midst of them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger, and see my hands, and reach here with your hand, and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. You know, one of the things you have to love about Jesus is the way that he addresses and talks to people. His exhortations to people, his rebukings of people, and likewise, how he's able to spot genuine faith. For you and I really can't do that because we don't know the hearts of people, but he does. He says, come here, put your hands in. Here they are. This is what you wanted, Thomas. Now put your hands in here and feel. Touch my side while you're at it. Put your hand into my side. That's what Thomas said. Until I see and I feel with my own hands, well, then I'll believe. Because that's how Christianity began, by seeing to believe. You know, I want us to think about this this morning. If you don't get anything else out of the lesson today, I just want you to get this next thing, okay? So please pay attention. What did Thomas see when he saw Jesus? Saw his hands, his arms, his side. What's he really seeing? Thomas is seeing the seriousness of sin. He is seeing firsthand what the other disciples have already seen. He is seeing what sin cost God. He is seeing that even a resurrected Jesus, who walks the earth again some, some 40 days before ascending to God, shows himself a resurrected body covered in the scars of sin. How serious is sin? Well, serious enough that God gives his only son, his only son, a sacrifice for that sin. And his son still wears the marks of how serious that is, even in the resurrection. That's how serious sin is. That's what Thomas is seeing firsthand. That's what each and every one of us will see someday firsthand. Now, a lot of times... People don't take sin very serious today, I don't think. And I don't want to say that. I can't, I can't speak for everyone. I certainly can't speak for you. But I will ask you this morning, do you take sin serious? Because sin enters the church all of the time, my friends. And some of us deal with sin personally. We deal with it on a personal level. And we may not be doing very well sometimes. Do we take it serious? For instance, I'll ask you this. Here's a good example. Do you love your enemies? Oh, I don't know if I to hear that one. Do you love your enemies? Luke 6, right? Verse 33 through 36. That tells us how to love our enemies. Do you love them? The way that Jesus tells you how to. What about hate? Do you have hate in your heart? Hate for another person. How serious is that to the Lord? What about your marriage? And we got a lot of people married in here. How serious do you take vows of marriage? For a husband to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And that a woman see to it that she respects her husband in all things, submits herself to him in all things as she would Christ. Because Christ is the head of the church, so he is the head of the body. That's serious. There's no more serious illustration in the Bible than that one there because it is Jesus and the church that he died for. Do you take that seriously? I'm going to tell you, I ask you that because I have seen some Christians who had not been married very long, 
uh, you know, fighting and carrying on with each other, treating each other kind of like garbage. I, I somewhat expect that because two new married people don't really know how to live together yet, even if they are Christians and they have trouble. <laughs> Nobody that's ever been married hasn't had trouble in their marriage. Except for me, I don't have any of that. I know everybody else does. All right? But what about those Christians who like to be examples to the young people? They've been married 30, 40, 50 years. Talked to a man one time. I said, you know, <laughs> brother, you've been married a long time. You still kind of treat your wife like a rug. Do you not take sin very serious? Your wife is not a rug. She is the most precious jewel in the crown that you own. That's serious. How serious is that? Well, it's serious enough, friends, that Jesus died for it. And his very relationship between you and him is the relationship of the church that he died for. That's how serious that is. How serious is it to raise my children according to the way the Bible says and not the way I feel like? Well, it's real serious. How serious is it to attend worship services? Serious. How serious is it to be baptized? I was talking with my class Wednesday night, the young kids, and I said, I said, uh, you know, Lord willing, God will give you enough time to respond to this. How serious is it, though? I said, well, I can tell you what, I sure hope this doesn't happen. But if you happen to meet the Lord before that day comes, you'll understand right then how serious that is. Why? Jesus died for it. Serious. Do we take these same sins, the ones we talked about this morning, the ones we had in our Bible class, do we take them as serious as God does? I want you to imagine this just for a moment. Of course, I'm, I'm not saying that this is how your death will go. No one knows that. But we do know we will answer for sin. Can you imagine standing before our God about anything we mentioned and, and, and saying, God, you know, I just didn't really think that it was all that serious for me to be baptized. Did you not think I took it serious? I tell you what, why don't you just take a look at my son? Show him your hands. That's how serious I thought it was. Loving my wife, loving my children, loving my brothers in the church. How about the one we often forget? I didn't really think it was all that serious. Share the gospel. To make that a priority, how serious did God take it? You know, these are one of those things that we don't like to talk about. Sin, the seriousness of sin. Why do we talk about that? Because, well, I was, I was, all we need to talk about that about people who are not Christians, you know. The sin we read about in this book, written through all the, especially the 13 epistles, are all directed at the church. Why? Because it doesn't go away. Like I told you in this morning's class, just because you become a Christian, all these things don't go away. You just now have a way to deal with them. You have a way out. There's good news about how to deal with these sins and how to overcome them. You know, the church began by seeing that very seriousness. Now you want to know why, why did these apostles give their lives for sin? Well, they saw it firsthand, didn't they? They saw it. <coughs> they saw the seriousness and they gave their entire lives for what they seen. But Jesus mentions another time that's taking place. He says, because you have believed, verse 29, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. You know, what that means is now we live in a time of blessed faith. I don't have to see Jesus in the person. I only need what was wrote down. I don't have to see him personally. 
You know, people will say this. If I could see Jesus today, like the apostle did, I believe like that. No, you wouldn't. Many people saw Jesus and yet did not believe. As a matter of fact, that's his whole life he dealt with that, and he dealt with it for another 40 days after the resurrection. Many people saw him and still did not believe. If Jesus isn't real to you in the Word of God, he's not going to be any more real to you if you would have seen him. In his own resurrection in Luke, the 24th chapter, he meets two men on road to Mass. And he meets those men. He starts talking to them. And he, don't, he, he keeps himself hidden from them. He doesn't let them know who he is. But then he asks them what they're talking about. And obviously I'm paraphrasing this to you this morning. It's about Jesus, the Nazarene, and who was crucified. We thought that it was he who would redeem Israel. He calls them fools. He says, you who are fool, you foolish men, and slow of heart to believe... In all the prophets have written. That's strange. And all the prophets have written. And then he says, it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he talked in the scriptures concerning himself. Now, Jesus could have done something a lot easier than that. He could have done what he did for Mary. He could have said, just turn around, guys, and look, it's me. Remember when I was with you last week teaching? A few days ago? Don't you remember that? Remember when you walked with me on the road and I taught you then? He could have done that, but he didn't. He didn't reveal himself and says they were fools because they didn't believe in what was written. Why? Even the resurrected Jesus, many times people did not believe. It's always been about the word of God. And that's what he goes on to say uh, in verse 30, what it says. Therefore, many other signs did Jesus also perform in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you, would, that, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Why was the Bible written? So that you would believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and in believing you may have life in his name. This is your evidence. This is your written document. The evidence, all the evidence you're ever going to have and all you ever need in order to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, my friends, and to obey him and have eternal life. He said, blessed are those who have not yet seen, who have not seen and yet believe. You know, and I don't find this so far withdrawn from normal logic. We believe in things all the time that we do not see. Don't we? Let me just ask you this. If I told you today that Abraham Lincoln never existed, what would you think about him? He'd say, of course he did. You're an idiot, Dad. And I said, well, why do you say that? How could you say so? Did you see him? Well, no, we didn't see him. Then how do you know he existed? Were you there? No, I wasn't there. Then how do you know? Because it's wrote down. It's what the history books tell me. So you believe what the books tell you. Can you imagine? 50 years from now, someone comes up and says, you know what? Barack Obama was never the president. Donald Trump was never the president. People would think you were a crazy person. They would put a straight jacket on you and lock you up in the loony house. You say, why? Did you see them? No, I didn't see them. Then why do you believe that? Well, because they're wrote down in the school books. Fair enough. Then why is it the one thing that has been written down, the one thing that truly supersedes all things, the one thing that really, truly matters is the one thing that people struggle with in the world. God's word was written down. It's evidence. It is a written document. So that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and in believing you may have life in his name. You know, what you can believe is the sin that you deal with can be okay. Peter dealt with sin. He dealt with enough of it. He left the Lord on the cross. Right into the night, cussing and swearing. And he said, I do not know the man. 
I can't imagine a worse thing than abandoning him like that at that time. But Peter also gave an answer, the same one that he received in Acts 2, verse 38, to the, to the brethren who wanted to know, well, what, men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 36 of Acts chapter 2. They realized they had just killed Jesus. They realized that they had sinned. And Peter responds to them and says, repent, each one of you. And be baptized. For the forgiveness of your sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call himself. The answer has not changed. You know, you might have a sin problem today. Uh, I understand. I'm with you. I have the same problem. We all suffer from the same problem. We all have sin problems. Do you mean Christians have sin problems? Absolutely. We talked about in our Bible class all these things that we had that we've mastered, right? Of course we do. But we're trying real hard. Aren't we? We're trying really hard to master. We can't do it though without the Lord. And without the blood to pay for our sins, my friends, there is no hope. The hope is in that blood. Wash away your sins. If you are a Christian today who is struggling with sin, why not get that sin out of your life? Stop letting it rule over you. Whatever it is, you've got to let it go. We talked about this morning about cutting it loose. You've got to cut it loose. It's killing you. Let it go. It costs a great and terrible price, my friends, but the reward cannot be be superseded. The reward is that you may be forgiven. And only God can do that. If you're not a Christian this morning, I hope you're considering that. I hope you're considering the seriousness of it. Am I standing before a righteous God in that condition? Jesus says himself in Mark 16 and verse 16, those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Yeah. 